Yeah, some shredding. Some shredding all the way from Japan. Hi, I'm Gary from learntoplaymusic.com and welcome. Um, today we're going to be doing the regular stuff. We're going to have a special guest. Uh, we want to interact, inspire, get you to ask some questions. So uh, don't forget your Q&A app and whack on your headphones and uh, look forward to talking more about it after the show. Today's guest is musician, composer and teacher Jason McNamara, joining us from Japan. Hi, Jason. Good morning, folks. How are you doing? Konnichiwa, ohayou gozaimasu is actually the correct way to say good morning ah. in Japanese. Konnichiwa. Well, uh, uh, yep, yep, that's nice. <laughs> ohayou gozaimasu. There you go. Oh, ohayou gozaimasu. Okay. Okay, so uh, first off, we're going to play a video of Jason in action. So let's get into that one. We're having some trouble with that, Jason, unfortunately. Seems like it. Yeah. Anyway, while I've got you, um, why did you decide to get into music in the first place? Well, funny enough, I really loved music. Like, my mum was just here in Tokyo for a holiday for a couple of weeks, and she told me something I didn't even know, which is apparently even as a baby, when my parents had music on, I was actually bopping in time and hitting things in time with music, even right from infant stage. So... Uh, it turns out that my roots go back further than I even knew until a week or two ago. Um, but it's as far as blood. Well, it seems to be. Yet, strangely enough, like much like um, your guest Peter last week said, I've never had a member in my family that I knew of who was musically doing anything. Um, okay, so yeah. it skipped a generation, maybe. Well, uh, it may have skipped a lot of generations because, like, going back through the history books, it doesn't seem to be that there was anybody else who was into it. And yet my brother, um, who's only 20 months younger than me, is also a drummer as well. Um, we used to play around Adelaide together many, many, many years ago, like 20-something years ago in bands. And, uh, yeah, so it, it's just been in me ever since I was a kid. I first thought I wanted to be a DJ, and then I kind of went, hang on. Why should I play other people's music when I could get out and play their music? Yet, oddly enough, I've made a larger career out of covers than original music over the years anyway. <laughs> well, most of us, that's usually the case. But most, most musos that are out there playing covers have got their own music going on. Well, that's as do sure. I, exactly. Yeah. So doing what you do, a guitarist, keyboardist, producer, um, it's taken you around the world, so how did you get into the international music scene in the first place? Well, the international thing for me was covers. Um, most of what I've done has been, aside from a few other things which we'll get into after. But uh, the cover thing, I have a couple of friends, Brian Atherton and David Hewitt, who were doing, well, Brian had already done the international thing, and he hit up David Hewitt, and David's a bass player and singer and does a few other things, and said, oh, we need a guitarist, we need a keyboard player, who do we know? And Dave just picked up the phone and rang me because we used to live together. And he said, oh, there's a tour happening in Dubai. Uh, this was 1998. And do you know anybody who might want to do it? And I said, well, I'd want to do it. He goes, oh, really? We didn't think you'd want to go because I was in a relationship at the time. They just figured I wouldn't want to go. I was like, hell yeah, let's do this. This would be awesome. And so that was how I first got involved was actually going on tour with friends. And it went from there. Fantastic. So uh, what surprised you about uh, some of the places that you've worked in? Is oh, anything God. Sort of... um, well, to, just to set up the scene, I mean, I toured Dubai, as I said, in 1998. And then one of the most surprising things happened straight away during that tour was we were at the end of that tour. It was two and a half months worth of playing there. And I, I, I'm 192 centimetres or six, three and a half. I'm a pretty tall guy. And then this guy walks into the Hard Rock Cafe when we were playing there one night. And it was about a week or two before we were supposed to finish. And he was like way taller than me. He was probably this much taller than what I am. Have we got nothing at all? 
No, no, you're you're okay. Okay, cool. Anyway, okay. and he was he was an Austrian guy who came in and invited us to go and play. You ready for it? In Kazakhstan. Mm. So we uh, hung out in Dubai for an extra week, and we went to Kazakhstan and played there for a New Year's Eve show, and spent six nights in Kazakhstan, and actually played one gig, and uh, it was a New Year's Eve show from '98 into '99. It was incredible. I mean, you're asking what amazing things happened. How the hell do you ever think you can end up in Kazakhstan of all places? And this was before the days of Borat, too. <laughs> Fantastic! Well, it's, it, it is. It's amazing where music can take you. The, the, well, it is the last place on earth you thought you'd be. No, oh, well, I never imagined. I mean, you know, back then, uh, my, I remember my brother said to me, "Oh, wow, you're going to the country of Ivan Drago, who was the bad guy, so to speak, in Rocky yeah. Three, I think it was." <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then I also ended up touring in China. I, I went to China three times, um, played Shanghai for three months, played Beijing for four months, uh, went to a place called Wuhan, which is more central China, went back there again and played in Wuhan again. Um, and uh, then after returning from Wuhan, I got home to Australia and part of connection of how I'm here in Tokyo, although that one didn't work out, I met a Japanese girl. And, of course, the first time I came to Japan, which was 2002, was because of a girl. Yeah, it, it seems to be uh, seems to be love takes us around the world as well. Yet the so, funny thing is that what took me to Japan from having met that girl was we met her at one of my gigs in Adelaide at PJ O'Brien's one night. Ah, that nice little link there. Well, it is, because seriously, like, I was playing in the band, and, and she I saw her before I'd even started setting up for the gig, and music just, I'm serious, like, it opens up so many doors, you just got to find connections and make things happen. Yeah, that's true, and, and it also uh, keeps the brain very active, I think that's why a lot of musicians tend to uh, look a bit younger than perhaps what they are. With a few exceptions, of course. <laughs> well, yeah, look, I mean, I'm 42 and I feel about 102 because my son is <laughs> so well at the moment, but that's the way it goes. Yeah, exactly. So it, just travelling around the world and playing music, do you find that people react the same way to it wherever you are? Does it seem to be a, a similar experience for everybody? Oddly enough, it's an interesting thing that you bring up about asking that. Um when I've been playing shows, I've actually found that international audiences are more responsive than audiences back home. And I don't mean to be dissing home, but it's a simple fact that if you're playing in a pub and everyone's standing around and drinking and blah, 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 this is not the original scene room, but this is the cover scene. Um, nobody really cares too much about that. They're just like, play Jesse's Girl. And I'm like, I'm not playing Jesse's Girl. There's no way I'm playing Jesse's Girl. Oh, but what a damn. Well, no, because you I see, was this going to ask you to play Jesse's girl. I could, but I won't. Um, but the point is, like when I've played out, like in other places around the world, you tend to have it that the audiences come there because it's a special thing to have a foreign band, which is why a lot of these countries that we've played in um, have actually hired foreign bands because there's a certain thing, and it happens in Australia as well in the same sense, that if a foreign musician comes to Australia and plays, everyone's like, wow, this is something new, this is something different, and they tend to give uh, a little bit extra themselves. So I'm not bagging out home, I'm just saying the simple fact that when it's something new and different, people are more intrigued. When it's something that you can get your hands on every day, people don't seem to really no, that's respond very, That's very true. Better. Yeah, you, you take for granted what's sort of on your doorstep too, don't you? To a small degree, yeah. Obviously, so music has, has, has made your life in many ways, has been at the root of it all. Um, what are some of the highlights for you? Um, well, look, uh, definitely um, getting to travel and, and being a working musician is a big thing. Like, when I've done that work before, I've had a few people say to me, why do you want to play covers? Why don't you want to play originals? It's a simple fact that it's paid a living. Rather than working for the man, Sometimes, you know, whether like say you work in hardware or you work in business or whatever, there's a lot of people who are making good money who aren't happy doing what they're doing. When you're a musician and you get to get out and play covers and whatever and you get to sharpen your skills and sharpen your craft, there's nothing like six nights a week worth of playing music in a band at a gig that's say a three month contract. You're playing so much like that. That's a good 70 plus shows in a three month period. What that does for you as a musician is huge because 
you don't have the luxury of, say, a rehearsal room where you can stop and redo. When you're on stage, it's sink or swim. You know, and if you make a mistake, you've got to plow on through. If you have a car wreck, you're in serious trouble as a musician because you've got to support the musicians in your band. And that's something that a lot of bands, I'm not saying every band does, but a lot of bands don't think about is the fact that if a musician has a train wreck on stage, it's how the rest of the band keeps on plowing through. It's how when you get off stage, you don't say, you're an idiot, can't believe you did that to us. That doesn't help anybody. It's a simple case of, okay, let's sit down and make sure that you learn the passage right. Or let's make sure, you know, that we haven't chosen a song that's beyond our reach or whatever it is. And it's really important to get through that stuff together. That's right. I think uh, mistakes are always going to happen as a musician, uh, particularly in a live situation. And it's just pretty much how you deal with it um, yep. and how you perhaps even cover it up. Mostly if you smile and get on with it, most people aren't even going to know it happened. It's so totally very, true. Very true. And music's all about um, sharing and experience is not about, you know, bringing each other down. It's about lifting each other up. Exactly right. right. So, um, yeah, there's always going to be a mistake. It's just a matter of how you deal with it, isn't it? And look, I mean, I've made videos of some of my shows, and I've, I've made disgusting mistakes on things, but I've still let them go online because the simple fact of the matter is it's not like I'm going to go back and re-overdub stuff just to try and make myself look better than what I really am. It's a, it's a simple fact. Um, there's a quote that runs around on Facebook a lot. I can't remember whose name was attached to it, um, but it says something along the lines of, to make a mistake as a musician, there's nothing wrong with that, but to play without conviction is inexcusable, and it's totally true. If you're going to get up there and you're going to play, like let's say you're going to play, for example, smoke on the water, as simple as it is, right? If you're up there and let's say you get to the solo and you play like this, that's all well and good uh, because the notes are all there, but that little thing of the intention and the feeling that goes behind it doing you like, It's not about how hard you grate the strings and all that. It's just about putting your own energy and feeling into what you're doing. It makes a huge difference. People feel that in the audience too. That's exactly right. It's, um, it's a conviction to the music that, that, that most audience mem members can, um, can see pretty well straight away. You're either convicted to the song or the piece of music or music in general, like a, a great deal of musicians. You, you can just tell they have a a great connection with the music and that's what the audience wants. Exactly. Uh, Jason, we don't, unfortunately we're having trouble with the uh, the video so we can do a link, uh, we can link up to the, the videos in the blog at the end of the show. Sure. Um, so for now we'll just plow on. Um, when, when you went to Japan first, what, well even now, what, what's the music scene like there? How do you compare it to say uh, Australia? Okay, well, it's an interesting thing. Um, I lived in Osaka originally from 2002 to early 2004, went back and lived in Melbourne for eight years after being there and then came back in 2012 and since then I live here in Tokyo now. Um, the Osaka thing was cool because in Osaka you've got Oh, well, in the surrounding area, you've got Osaka, you've got Kobe or Kobe as everyone likes to pronounce it as, and Kyoto. And within particularly Osaka and Kobe, there's a lot of live music where you can just get out and play a gig and have a great time. There's original stuff as well. But here in Tokyo particularly, the original scene here in Tokyo is massive. Um, there are gigs happening like literally any night of the week. Um, the covers thing over here in Tokyo is interesting because there's only one regular cover band pub in all of Tokyo, which is hard to believe a city of 30 million people and the size that Tokyo is. There's one regular corner cover band pub. And what's, what, what's that? Is that the Hard Rock Cafe or something like that? No. Oh, now, see, here's a funny thing. The Hard Rock Cafe here is just simply two... There's two Hard Rocks and they're restaurants and they're tiny. They're like literally... Um, I'm trying to think of something Adelaide equivalent wise to, to put, put it this way. It's just very small restaurant yeah. bar almost size. Uh, there's no not even space to put in an acoustic duo. That's how small they are. 
Um, as far as the live thing happening here in Tokyo with original music, it's pretty much the old pay-to-play system of what they used to have in Los Angeles and places like that that are well known where you essentially have a room which has all the amps, all the PA system, the stage, the lighting, usually a sound guy, really good equipment in there. And then the bands uh, usually put four, five, six bands on the lineup to be able to cover costs. They essentially hire out the space uh, because they're all called live houses here in Japan. They hire out the space, they pre-sell their tickets, and then get their friends to come along to the gig. And if you don't sell your allocated amount of tickets, you basically lose money. So, you know, the bands over here work very, very, very hard to be able to get people to come to their shows. They're promoting the crap out of their shows on Facebook and through various methods of other Japanese social networks as well. Um, putting up flyers for their bands. It's real hard slogging, but it pays off because people, they, they create a groundswell. Um, there's a band of a bunch of girls. It's like There's a lot of girl musicians here, by the way. I just want to point this out. Female musicians, go for it. Get involved. Um, yeah, like, sounds great. Well, it's huge. Like This band is called what reads as Gang Lion, but it's actually Ganglion. Um, it's actually some sort of a skin disease, but anyway, really nice girls, very hardworking band, and they're an exceptional band. I've actually got an interview, which I'll send you guys a link to, you can put on the page, which I did with them at last year's Tokyo Guitar Show. Um, and they did their best with English, and they're a really nice bunch of girls and a great, hardworking band. Great. So what are you doing with yourself right now, Jason, apart from obviously uh, checking out girl bands? <laughs> Well, okay, that was well put. I like that. Good job. Um, I started out in 1989 working in a guitar shop, and right now here in Tokyo, that's what I do. I work for Ishibashi Music, which is a very, very cool musical instrument store, and I happen to work in their flagship store. And as anybody who's heard me say when they come into the store, I am the only native English speaker in all of Japan who works at a guitar shop, and I love what I do in the guitar store. Um, it gives me just an amazing bunch of things at my facility. I used to work in Melbourne for Eastgate Music. I worked for Allen's in Melbourne as well, and I also worked in Adelaide for Derringers. So I learned a lot from Peter Vitek, the manager of Derringers. Like I worked there too. Well, so there you we go. had something in common. Yeah, yeah exactly. I just never knew that. And, and yeah. as you know, you can learn so much from Peter because he's yeah. just so knowledgeable and experienced in what he does. And Marcello, the owner of Eastgate Music, was the same. The pair of those guys, I'll tell you, is the best education. Yeah. And, and Terry O'Reilly, did you work with I, Terry? I worked with Terry, and Terry's a great guy. I got a lot of time for Terry. I worked with he's, Steve he's, Salvi as well, who's got his own yeah, another, yeah, too. Another, yeah, fantastic. You know? Yeah, they're and, people that know their guitars, that's for sure. And that's the thing. Like Ian Wright, who used to have the Adelaide Rock Shop, and Alan Atwood, I used to work for them as well. Oh, sorry, I didn't work with them. Sorry, I knew them. I didn't work for either of them, but I, I knew them. I worked with Alan at Regent Music when I first started in 1989. But here in Tokyo... The difference is what I get to do is like, for example, you, you guys would freak out. You come into the store that I work at. I made a trailer for this thing of me walk for this music space interview now of me walking around with my GoPro camera and just filming a quick little hello. So if you watch that, you'll be able to have a quick little look around the store. But that store has 2,000 guitars in the store. It has the largest collection of brand new Gibson Custom Shop in the world. Yeah, I, I was. I went there in two thousand and one, and I remember there you go. Like being like being like a kid in a lolly shop. So yeah, it was it's fantastic. Incredible. You know, yeah. and and I get to meet famous musicians in there and actually have a chat with them about anything. And most of the famous people that I've met are just really open and warm and welcoming. As long as you don't walk up like, oh my god, it's you. What do I do? They don't want to hear that. You just walk yeah. up and say, like for example, Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth was in the store last week. It was just like. The hell, and he's taller than me. Um, the best wow. encounter I had was Alex Lifeson from Rush was in the store two months ago, and I'm a big Rush fan, and, and having Alex Lifeson in the store was just mind-blowing. And He wasn't even on tour. He was just there on holiday with his wife and just popped in, and uh, so I pulled out my camera and actually filmed the video with him that they actually put on Rush.com and also put on the um, Rush Facebook page as well, and it's had like 35,000 views or something like that. Um, which has been pretty awesome. I had people connecting with me from all over the world, leaving comments. Um, thanks for making the video. Uh, when are they coming back to Japan? When are they coming to Australia, of course? I mean, 
I'm not their press agent. I just got to meet Alex and have a chat with him about all that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, that's, that's fantastic. It, 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 and once again, there you go, playing guitar and knowing a bit about guitar takes you to a guitar shop in Japan. Where exactly. You get to meet, where you get to meet some of your heroes. I'll, I'll just quickly say I sold Joe Walsh a guitar at nice. Paris many years ago, which was a bit of a thrill. I didn't even know who he was when he first walked in. <laughs> anyway, that's probably why he gravitated to me, I would imagine. Just like you said, they like, they like the experience of just a one-on-one rather than people sort of gushing and tripping over themselves. Exactly. So and, and, you know, like when it comes to those sorts of guys, um, don't forget Australia has musicians who are on that level and beyond as well. I mean, you look at guys like Simon Hosford, who tours with John Stevens and does a lot of the music shows, Dancing with the Stars and Australian Idol and all that. Um, you look at James Ryan, who plays with Vanessa Amorossi. Um, Johnny Salerno plays drums with her. Chris Becker plays bass with pretty much everybody, including those sorts of people. Um, they're all Melbourne cats, but yeah. they they sat down and they studied. They know their scales. They know their rhythms. They know their timing. They know how to interact with other musicians. Um, and it's it, that's how you get up to that sort of level. And, and guys like that, like seek out those names on on YouTube and Facebook and whatever, because there are inspirations that we have in Australia for musicians who are working musicians who are on that level of where a lot of musicians want to be because they simply did the most important things. One, you've got to know what you're doing. Two, and the beyond everything most important thing, you've got to be amicable and good to get along with. Nobody wants to work with a difficult person. And I've unfortunately had my moments where I've been a bit hot-headed and difficult to work with in the past too, and I've learned from that. Um, you've got to check the ego at the door, so to speak, and you've got to just get along. Because if you think being in a relationship with a girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, whatever is difficult, try doing that with three or four other people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially if you're touring. <laughs> you know, well, and that, that's just it. Like, I was working in an original project with a guy called Justin Murphy, um, who is an original singer. He's still got his own group going in Melbourne. Um, and it was a great experience and a hard experience because I didn't necessarily see eye to eye with him all the time. Um, and we went on tour, and it was hard. We actually did a complete east coast from Melbourne all the way up. We got as far as the Gold Coast and played a lot of shows in between, and it was hard because the relationships weren't so solid. But David Birch, who was the drummer in that group, he actually came with me to Dubai on the last tour that I did of the international thing in 2012. Uh, I got a bunch of videos that we did of playing over there, and it was just amazing. Um, you know, so you can keep relationships with some people. Unfortunately, relationships don't work out with others, but don't burn bridges because it'll come back to bite you in the butt. Yeah. So what uh, what's coming up for you, Jason? Are you uh, have you got any projects that you're working on, or any tours coming up? Can you let us know? Well, these days uh, I'm still playing, of course. Um, I do a lot of my playing is, is mainly used for the videos and stuff that I make at work. So rather than actually being a working musician right now, as far as a playing live musician, I'm teaching. Uh, I've got guitar students who I teach every single week. Uh, so I do that before work in the mornings on the weekends. And also the big thing that I'm doing now is video. I do a lot of video editing and having the music skills, the sense of timing, the ear for knowing what fits in where and whatever, it's helping me so much with video. And I am actually a, a professional video editor and, and videographer these days as well. Um, I'm using GoPro cameras on guitar headstock, so I'm getting cool point of view cameras, shots. Um, I just did uh, Jesper Stromblad, or Jesper Stromblad, who's ex in Flames guitar player. Um, I just made his official worldwide promo video for the fact that he's now playing court guitars who have really lifted their game from the old days of when we remember court being yes, like... Yes, they have. Yeah. yeah, they used to be like a, a very basic student instrument and now they're just making incredible stuff and he's now playing their stuff and I've made his video. Um, I've got a few other video projects coming up which unfortunately I'm not allowed to talk about but let's just say I'll be doing something very extreme next week. Cool. Sounds good. So just uh, on practicing, do you still yep. practice? Do you sit down and what, what sort of things are you working on? What sort of things are inspiring you at the moment? When I practice, I actually tend to practice things that I think I already know sometimes. Like I'll learn new stuff, of course, but 
going over stuff that you've learned before and retaining the knowledge, that's the big thing. Um, so, like, I'm the sort of guy that I'm like a library of songs. If you throw me out a song that, you know, whatever, I'm like, oh, Highway Star, sure. And I'll know it. Um, Bohemian Rhapsody. Keeping up the knowledge of things you've learnt in the past is actually really important and gets mis gets left behind, I feel. And I tell this to my students too. It's really good to learn lots of new tunes and learn new stuff. But remember to go back and practice stuff that you've learned before because it's easy to forget things that you've learned before. Um, I don't really learn new covers much at the moment because I'm not out playing a gig. But learning new techniques and things, um, Billy Sheehan says... Try every day to learn something that you didn't know before, which is true, and unfortunately I'm guilty of not doing that myself, but I will tell other musicians to get out and do that. <laughs> yeah, so you basically what you were saying then is, is consolidate, you know, to, to, to gather up all the information you know and, and keep, keep working on that as well as um, perhaps learning. I think the Billy Sheehan thing is a good idea too. It is. Learn, learn a new tune every day or a new riff or... Maybe even pick up a different instrument. And then like that. the hardest thing I think to do is to go back and go, you know what, I didn't know what I was doing, and give yourself the discipline to relearn something. Um, not just to relearn the riff, but I mean, relearn the theory behind it. Like, being, th there are kind of two schools of thought. There's some in between, but mostly two. There's either I'm a studied musician and I know my theory and I know what I'm doing, or no, I don't want to do theory because that's too conformative or whatever the excuse is. Um, if you don't know simple things like that that is called C major, or for that matter, take it down a fret, and that's B major, and why that goes from, let's say, the C major to the C minor, and the fact that it's the third that's flat, the sixth that's flat, and the seventh that's flat. If you don't know those simple tools and you get into a room with other people that do, you're kind of left behind. And some people yeah. who don't know that stuff tend to get argumentative and aggressive because they're dealing with the fact that they don't know it themselves rather than saying, okay, look, I should learn this. I think that's yeah, the thing point. a lot of musicians need to do is, is check the pride at the door. Learn that's a great, stuff. great point, mate. It, it happens quite often, musicians that, that believe they don't need to learn the basics of music. I can never understand that. I mean, if you want to speak, speak properly. Exactly that's right. Same, same with music. Why would, you, why, why would you leave those sorts of things at the door? Um, as, like you said, leave your ego at the door. Then, well, why would you leave you know, your, your basic uh, building blocks of music at the door as well? So exactly I think right. You're right. Most most great musicians I know have a, a pretty solid understanding of how music works, and you and you know they're great musicians even before they play their instrument. Exactly right. Um, I, I'll right. just throw in a quick example. The the last cover band show that I was doing in Melbourne was a band called Doctor Shred and the Electric Mayhem because our singer loved Doctor Teeth and the Electric Mayhem from the Muppets, and so my shredding playing he called it that. And believe me, there are a lot of guys out there who can shred better than me. But the point is, that was the greatest band I ever had in my life, originals, covers, whatever. Because it was four guys. Um, Christian Nativo, the drummer from Vanishing Point, came on board and played with us for a good year and a half, two years worth of the band's life. Um, Paul Rock, the singer, also played some instruments and was actually a drummer as well. But he did a lot more than just drums. He was a drummer who, much like a lot of really great drummers, understood a tuned instrument, understood melody, yeah. understood scales and stuff like that too. And Dan Stone, the bass player, um, that band worked because, one, we never, ever, ever, ever had an argument in that band, ever, because we all respected each other. When we had new tunes to learn, everybody, this is point number two, everybody got in, learned their tunes and never rocked up without having learned their stuff because they didn't want to let each other down. Three, it worked because... Everybody was patient with each other in the sense that just because, say, for example, I was more theoretical than Dan, the bass player, in the sense of my scales and stuff, he still took the time and learned his stuff to get it right. He wasn't necessarily the greatest singer in the sense of doing harmonies, but he still tried and pitched in. And when he didn't get it right, Paul and I didn't jump on him. Um, 
And that's the other thing I really want to make a point of here. If you're a musician and you're playing drums, guitar, bass, keyboards, whatever, saxophone, learn to sing harmonies. You don't have to be a great singer. Learn to learn how a one, a three, and a five goes together. Simple thing like that. Pitch a harmony, play a note, and sing the opposite. Learn to sing harmonies. It's the best tip I can give a musician aside yeah, from being a decent guy. That's great. I totally agree with that. And learn and learn your, your theory. As you said, one, three, five is pretty much at the heart of all music that we listen to. Completely. All music is one, three, five, whether the, the, the third's flattened or whether the fifth is altered. It's all the, the building blocks of speech. Which exactly. Is we as musicians want to do is speak to the and, listener. And make stuff up, do things that people think you shouldn't do. So there's no reason why you can't say take a one, three, five, flatten the three, sharpen the five, and That's all it. of a sudden you've actually got what sounds like a completely different chord because it is when you put the notes together, but there's nothing wrong with doing that. Yeah, but it's all based around the one, three, five once again. And that's, like I said, what the building blocks are all about. Um, up some time for some questions with Ben. Um, we have an email from Jane. Uh, how do you recommend being a professional, uh, beginning a professional uh, career as a musician? Um, should I go to a high level of study, uh, network, or start by getting a musical job like yourself? Did Good you question. That, yeah, I did. Uh, now, Jane, um, the way that I did it was I submerged myself in and surrounded myself in being around other musicians. Um, to get a professional job of doing it, if you p get paid to play music, you are a professional musician. It's that simple. So whether you are paid to play in a local cafe or whether you are lucky enough to be like me and get paid to play at the Hard Rock Cafe in Dubai, it makes no difference in the sense that once you are paid to be a musician, you are a professional musician. Um, you just need to make sure that you deliver on the goods. So practice, as we've discussed here, uh, is a very important thing to do. Um, the other tip about doing that is you need to play with as many musicians as you possibly can because everybody plays differently. Every drummer plays differently, every bass player, every singer reacts differently having the experience of playing with different musicians and lots of different musicians makes that work out. Um, the cover band scene that I did, there are networks on Facebook, unlike when we first started doing it, there are networks on Facebook of international touring musicians and the scene is just known as the international cover band scene. Um, if you wanted to get out into Dubai or Bahrain or China or Indonesia and all these other places where these sorts of gigs happen, um, you need, and this is actually the important part for this answer, you need good demo material. So if you need to spend a bit of money and pay somebody who actually knows what they're doing, not just your mate who thinks he knows what he's doing, uh, to make promo work for you, you need good audio quality, you need good video quality. But just to make that point about making good audio and video quality, this thing here is a Zoom H4n. All right. You can pick up one of these. I'm not sure the retail price in Australia these days. You need to look it up. Whether it's new or second hand, and you can record live from the mixing desk and from these mics at the same time and produce excellent quality audio for your demos. It's just spending a little bit of money and plugging it all in correctly and getting the sound. Cameras, don't use an iPhone. Get something that's on a tripod or something that has a good quality steady shot. A lot of DSLR cameras these days take really good video as well. Make quality promo material. It's the only way you're going to get work. Great. Any more questions, Ben? Uh, we have a question from Mark. Uh, how important is a good live music scene to bands and musicians starting out? It's really important. And I've got to tell you, if you're in Adelaide, uh, anywhere in Australia, there is a really good live music scene. Um, you know, if you're a high school kid, play high school gigs. Just play shows. If it's a backyard party, look, that's a little bit sort of not so great. But if you're going to get out and and do that uh, in a backyard party, for example, don't drink. That's the big thing. Don't get drunk and think, yeah, we sound great, because you don't. You listen back to a recording and it doesn't work out that way. 
Um, I'll speak for yourself. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to be. I don't. I'm not a drinker, and all my friends know that about me. Um, you know, so I, I maybe I'm being an advocate for last year. I don't really give a crap. People can do whatever the hell they want to themselves. It's that's their right, choice. That's right. That's right. And uh, I've got. No, I've you're got, right. I mean, getting drunk is probably not a good idea. A couple of beers. Yeah. If you know how to control it and you know your level, that's fine. Um, that's right. But yeah, I, I think you know. You've uh, you've just got to play as much as you can. You know that's the whole thing. The Australian music scene is good. There are pubs still that you can play, and there's less than what there used to be when I was growing up. But don't forget, like I said, I'm 42. If you're 19 right now, you don't know the way it used to be. So don't worry about the way it used to be. Worry about the way it is now. Um, get out and play as much as you can. Even yeah. if you need to hire out a space and a hall and whatever, and you believe you can get people to come along, promote it. Make sure you give them their money's worth when they rock up. Don't over promise whatever you do whether it's as yourself as a musician or as a band don't say we're going to give you the greatest show on earth because you know what Kiss said they did that in 1970s and they pretty much did as much as I'm a big Kiss fan they did they delivered a spectacle um, yeah. that's what you got to do yeah just play as much as you can um, we're going to wrap up now Jason unfortunately we haven't been able to play any of your videos but uh, we can you can get onto the uh, blog at the end of the show and check out the video links. There's two or three of them there so you can see what Jason's been doing. There's also a little uh, thing on uh, sequencing that uh, you might be interested in, in, in checking out. But um, I just want to finish. Uh, first of all, thanks very much, Jason, for, Pleasure. For, for coming along or being there in your kitchen. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, there was a video that I actually filmed for this of me roaming around Tokyo the other night that I did just for this so that people do realise I actually really am in Japan. It's not like I'm just sitting somewhere in the world. I am really in Japan for the record. Yeah, that's great. So be a, you better check that out uh, with the links. Um, I just want to take a little moment to pay tribute to Doc Neeson who sadly passed away uh, yesterday morning. Yes, indeed. Um, obviously, don't need to say much more. A great influence on Australian rock and roll. And Definitely. most of us my age, and, and, you, and perhaps you as well, Jason, were, were influenced by him and the Angels at some point. Well, well, they were a great Adelaide band. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, so thanks for watching, everyone, and uh, we'll see you again next week. At the same time, same place, and we'll see you on the blog, and you can check out the videos. Ciao. Mm -hmm.